Well, hello, Word of Christ International Church. It's so good to be with you, family. Here we are at week nine, and week nine of God's master plan as we move moving through this series, going a little deeper um, in understanding what was on the heart of the Father, what was his intent. We have to believe that everything that God does is with person uh, with purpose. It's intentional. And his master plan for mankind, we weren't just randomly created. We were created with intent and with purpose. And that's what we're discovering as we go through this journey with God's master plan. Um, well, I want to thank those of you that came out last week locally here with our local body at Word of Christ. It was a wonderful time for us to be together. It was great to see everyone be around the children, be around the families, get a chance to embrace and to be together. Uh, I want to challenge you that weren't able to be with us. Um, I'm going to ask you the same thing that we talked about during our gathering. One of the questions that we felt the Spirit of God prompting us uh, was the question of where are you? And and we saw this with, with Adam, we saw it with Cain, and we felt the, real, the Spirit of God prompting us, where are you? Not physically, obviously, not where are you physically located. Of course, he knows that. But where are you on your mind? Where are you on this journey? Where are you on this spectrum of really understanding your identity? And I want to challenge you that it's not enough just to stick, stick your, your toe in the water or just to try it or just to learn about it. You have to dive in. You have to dive into the deep side of the pool and go all in and let this river flood your heart. And today you're going to hear more about that um, as we look at the flood of Noah and what the Father accomplished through that. So join us as we head in with Rose through this next lesson, this next teaching of God's master plan, as we look at the story of Noah. God bless you, family, and we'll see you on the other side. Hello, family and friends. My name is Rose Romandi, and I am really excited and honored to be with you again this week as we unveil God's master plan throughout the Bible, basically. In the last few weeks, we have been talking about this beautiful plan of God for humanity and we've been spending a lot of time in the book of Genesis. Today in this video we are going to talk about the story of Noah and uh, uh, just to see the plan of God and understand that God was involved in every details in our lives, in the life of people, from the first day of creation, God was involved in every details of everything that was happening in, in the world that we are living because he never, uh, you know, forsook us. He never forgot about us. He never left us alone. He never forgot his own plan for humanity. And even though, uh, you know, after mankind ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they fell short of that you know understanding and that identity that god had for them and god created them to be but god never forgot about them mankind forgot about who god really is because of a wrong understanding a false image of god that serpent started giving to mankind if you remember in genesis chapter 3 serpent told eve that um you know god no god you know eve said god told us if we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil we die and the serpent says no actually basically this is not what the this is not what god said and god actually knows that if you eat of it you will be like god and and when you see here you see that the serpent gave a false image of God to us and um, and we thought that God has always been our enemies we thought that God separated himself from us we thought that God is punishing us we thought that you know um, you know God is this angry bloodthirsty person who requires blood <laughs> and so that's why he sent Jesus so that he can pour out his anger on Jesus so now his anger is satisfied and he's not <laughs> really pouring that anger on me and none of those things 
brings out the true image of God throughout the gospel God is trying to bring man into that understanding of knowing who he has always been who God has always been to man and it was us who opened who closed our eyes to this amazing image of who he is so now when we come to the story of the God to, to the story of Noah uh, we, we, we still we can see it like how this darkness of understanding is expanding and growing throughout this you know throughout the earth and by the time you come to Genesis chapter 5 uh, and uh, when you look at verse 29 and um, actually look at verse 28 in Genesis chapter 5 it says Lamech lived 100 and, uh, 182 years and had a son and he called his name Noah saying this one will comfort us concerning our works and the toil of our hands uh, because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. So we already talked about this, but I'm going to quickly um, shed a light again on this verse that, you know, this is Lamech, Noah's father is in toil, work of the hand, and he has a conclusion that, you know what, actually the uh, the reason we are in this curse it's because the lord has cursed the ground but if you go to genesis chapter 3 and actually i can show you genesis chapter 3 verse 17 god is talking to adam and he says to adam adam curse is the ground because of what you did and and do you see that darkness of understanding of who god really is it started actually going through the generations and and passing from one knowledge passing to the next and and now we have this image of who god is and we forgot that no this image that we think who god is is the image of man and this is how man creates a false image of god and worships that image you know and worships the image and this is called idolatry because you're worshiping an image that is made from your own hand and from your own understanding i remember uh, you know there was a time i went you know i just went out praying for this uh, you know uh, praying for people on the street and I, I came across this girl and she she said you know she said something you know um I, I think I told her I told her you know God loves you and she said well I don't believe that and I'm like okay so maybe God hates you <laughs> if you don't believe it and I just and I started laughing and she laughed too and she ended up saying you know uh, all the religious stuff that how god is mad and you know i did all the things there is no forgiveness and all of a sudden i stopped i said oh my goodness i would run from this god that you are <laughs> you are uh, like explaining to me and yeah if that's the god you believe you better run away from him but the god the truth is he's not what you think he is and and you know and in and when you start seeing the hands of god through all the generations you realize how god has been working prophesying even through the names because noah is the noah actually is the you know the 10th generation from adam like ninth generation from adam and with adam is the 10th generation of mankind and and i uh, one day i just i wrote down these 10 names from adam to noah and actually, I'm going to read them for you here so that you, we can see that even through the names, God is revealing his identity, his plan for mankind and man's identity and who he really is. The first man, Adam, is called basically man, right? So those names, they could have different meanings, but I, I um, you know, there are some major meanings here for each name. So man also has a meaning of red, but basically means man, right? Adam means man. And then Adam Adam had a son his name was Seth and Seth means appointed and Seth had a son his name was Enosh and Enosh means mortal and then Enosh had a son his name was Canaan and means sorrow or possession and Mahalalel is the son of Canaan and his name means the blessed God 
And then the next generation called Jared. Jared means shall come down. And Enoch, which is the seventh from Adam, means teaching. Then we have Methuselah, which is Noah's grandfather, and his name means his death shall bring. And Lamech means mighty or powerful, and Noah means rest or comfort. So this is the this is ten generation from Adam all the way to Noah. But but now let me just read the names, only their meanings, so we can understand what God is trying to say only through the first 10 generation. Man appointed mortal positions. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring mighty or powerful comfort. <laughs> Do you see the blessed God shall come down and his, his death shall bring powerful comfort. Noah's grandfather, his name was his death shall bring and, the, and, and, the, the, and his father was powerful, like powerful, which means like it's uh, Lamech means mighty or powerful and Noah means no comfort so his death shall bring a powerful comfort and interestingly the the year that the flood happened it was the year that Noah's grandfather uh, Methuselah passed away and his name was his death shall bring a powerful comfort that's why when Noah was born they said you know what this son is going to bring a, a comfort for us but in the time that Methuselah died and that flood started happening. So today we are going to see, we understand that the flood of Noah, which took place on earth, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't for destruction, it was actually for salvation of mankind. Now let's take a look at, uh, you know, chapter, um, chapter, uh, look at chapter 6 verse 5. It says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So do you know, do you know, do you know that word thoughts there? It's actually the word imagination. Every intent of the imagination that was in the heart of man was continuously evil. So, you know what, I can show you. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. And uh, we can find that verse, in, uh, that verse in Isaiah chapter 55. And uh, we can take a look at verse 9 here. It says, For as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So this is God is speaking, right? In Isaiah chapter 50, 50, 55. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So this is even imagination or it can have a meaning of thoughts too. It says, you know, my ways are higher and better and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So do you see that this, when we see the thoughts of God are higher that means he has that he's not thinking earthly which is from below beneath but his minds and his thoughts are heavenly so that's why God says you know my thoughts are higher than yours but the thoughts of people in Genesis chapter 6 they were continuously evil they were continuously thinking evil in their hearts so that's why when we come to Colossians chapter 3, um, we see that the Apostle Paul writes and says, set your mind on things above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So there is a place, then basically it says, you know what, you need to come to a place of awareness of your conscience, your mind, your thoughts, your understandings, your beliefs must not be from below, from the earth, where all the wickedness dwells, where the land is cursed, when Adam was deceived, where it's dust, dust 
it's earthly. It's actually, you need to be um, elevated and ascended to the higher realm of thinking, which is the mind of Christ. And today we want to see that the flood of Noah is a symbolic of um, that, you know, uh, work of the cross that cleansed the conscience of you and me so we can be elevated to a higher level of thinking. So therefore, God here says, you know, I'm going to do bring a flood on earth. Look at um, uh, look at look at verse uh, eight in uh, chapter six of Genesis, verse eight. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So therefore, everything that God is going to do, the flood and everything that is happening, it's toward bringing a blessing right because god says you know what i'm gonna save the earth through this man noah so that's why the flood is the symbolic of the blessing and we'll see this shortly too but look at verse 9 before we move on to first peter it says this is the genealogy of noah noah was a just man perfect in his generation noah walked with god so this is the second time we basically see that a man is walking with God. The first time was uh, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. And this is the second time, which is Noah, that is walking with God. So, and I know in the time of Seth and all the stuff, people are turning back to God and they're worshiping and I know th those stuff. But my point is here that Adam never walked with God. When God came walking, he hid himself because he had messed up. <laughs> he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here says Noah walked with God. That's why Noah found grace in, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So look at verse 10. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence, right? So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh uh, had corrupted their ways on earth. Do you see all flesh were corrupted? So an apostle Paul comes and says, listen guys, corruption cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption cannot inherit in corruption. So that's why it got to be a change of corruption into the incorruption. It has to be a cleansing first so that the incorruption will take place so the kingdom of God can come to the picture. So I want to encourage you that when you, when you and I are reading the story of Noah, let's just read through the spirit and see what God is giving a message to us today and what the story of Noah is revealing to us today. And I know, you know, so many times, you know, we read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and we see all the stories. We are like, oh my goodness, you know, why did God do this? Look at all those women died, the children died, and all this stuff died. And, you know, I think this is just, scriptures are written through the Spirit, and we need to read them in the Spirit to understand the message that is conveyed here. So we need to understand the Bible is not the story of creation and it's not the story of everybody on earth. The Bible is the story of the redemption. And that means there is one line of generation is taken from all these people on earth because God wants to bring redemption to mankind. And there are some specific stories are written here only for us to come into that wisdom and understanding of the plan or God's master plan for mankind and the story of Noah is one of them so with that being said let's go to first Peter chapter uh, let's first Peter chapter 3 and Apostle Peter here, he brings the example of Noah and surprisingly <laughs> to many of us, uh, he sees what happened in the story of Noah as a salvation, not as a destruction. So the carnal mind that doesn't read through the understanding of the spirit sees destruction all the time. But the moment you put the mind of Christ there, you see redemption. So 
if you read through the flesh, the Bible, you see death and destruction. But if you read through the eyes of the spirit, you understand the true message of the Bible, which is the story of redemption. In every story, you will find how God brought that redemption to mankind. We, 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 we um, you know, we, uh, last week, I guess it was last week that we uh, talked about the story of Abel and Cain and how God has been working to bring that redemption to mankind so now this is like let's go to first peter chapter 3 and look at verse 18 it says for christ also suffered once for sin the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit so keep in mind we just read in genesis chapter we just read in genesis chapter 6 that all flesh were corrupted on earth so now keep in mind here is talking about crucifixion of jesus that how he was put to death in the flesh and the next verse is talking about the flood of noah so basically what it's saying is that that flesh that was corrupted needed to put to death and that's why the flood of noah comes to the picture and look at next verse it says by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine line suffering waited in the days of Noah so I just want to put this in bracket usually when I bring people to these scriptures because I want to show them the flood of Noah and get a message people get stuck in verse 19 and they quickly want to understand oh, what does it mean God went to preach in the spirits in prison like you know this is the message is not about that verse the message is about the flood of noah and the salvation so move on with me here and so that we can understand this message and i want to encourage you if you want to have discussion in your groups you know and uh, so just pick up from around that flood of noah to to make it open and once this opens up for you then you will understand verse 19. so therefore it says so uh, they were evading in the days of noah when the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through the waters so do you see it says okay brings the story of noah and it says in the story of noah seven uh, uh, eight souls i'm sorry eight souls were saved through the water so the the flood of noah now apostle peter taking a look at the flood of noah and says oh okay so that was pointing at the salvation because eight souls were saved through the through the through the waters why is it says because it says in genesis all flesh were crop on earth and noah was the one who found grace in the sight of god and do you think that they weren't corrupt their sons or you know the children yes they were they were corrupt but because noah found grace he could save his household from the corruption that was on the earth so now here we see that noah who brings comfort is actually he was the uh, let me read this here so verse 21 <laughs> says what i'm what i want to say verse 21 says there's also an antitype which now saves us so the flood of noah was the antitype basically <laughs> there's also an antitype um, uh, that saves us baptism so baptism was the uh, is the antitype of basically uh, the, the noah so let me put it this way what happened is it says okay guys you know that the flood of noah happened brought salvation of eight souls so this was maybe this was pointing to a salvation that would come through the baptism that is in christ jesus so now let's let's continue reading verse 21 not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward god through the resurrection of jesus christ so do you see it says okay at the time when the flood came, it was earthly cleansed the earth but now 
what happens in the baptism in Christ Jesus is not to remove the filth of the flesh. Actually, something greater must happen, and that is the removal or the cleansing of our conscience. So in Genesis chapter 5, God said, the thoughts, every imagination and intent of the heart of man was evil. The conscience of man was evil. But the flood came and it cleansed the earth and it was basically fleshly way of doing that. And that's why God said later on, I will never ever do that. Why? Because the no outward cleaning will clean the cup. Jesus came and says, okay, guys, you Pharisees, you always try to cleanse the outside, but you must clean the inside. And as soon as the inside is clean, the outside will be clean too. So that prophecy over Noah's name that he shall bring a comfort to us, it wasn't like Noah never brought comfort to mankind. And if he had brought it, Jesus didn't need to come to bring that comfort. Noah was the type of man to pointing to the plan of God's um, salvation toward man. So you and I today, when we go and read the story of Noah, we realize what is happening through the baptism in Christ Jesus. So I guess this is really powerful because we are learning today what happens in the baptism, what happens in the cross, in the crucifixion of Jesus. So here says, you know what, that baptism, the baptism in, in, in Christ, it's going to be like a flood in your conscience and it will cleanse your conscience from some stuff that I'm going to show you. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. All right. In Hebrews chapter 9, it's talking about the blood of Jesus, right? So it's talk, it talked about the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer. And now by the time we get to verse 14, it says, How much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without a spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. So I want you to write this down on your notebook. Unfortunately, I didn't bring my uh, screen here to write it down for you. So I wanted to write it down on your notebook right now. Number one, the blood of Jesus cleansed the conscience from, number one, from dead works. And you can put the reference there, 914, Hebrews 914. So do you see, keep in mind as we are reading these verse, the flood of Noah, is the, the symbolic of the you know baptism in Christ Jesus that cleansed the conscience. Here says the uh, the first thing that cleanse that happens basically, it's from dead works. Dead works. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's go to the next one, and I'll get back and I'll talk more about this. Uh, so now let's go to uh, verse uh, chapter ten, verse two. Still talking about the sacrifice of the old and new. And by the time it gets to the verse 2, uh, the writer says, For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? So he's talking about the old covenant sacrifices. So if those sacrifices could um, cleanse the sin, um, so after a year bringing, so they didn't need to bring again because their sins are cleansed. But it says, no, actually, this is not what happened. Something else was happening. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. Because if those sacrifices could purify them from sin, they didn't have the consciousness of sin again to bring another sacrifice. So do you see consciousness of sin? So write in your notebook, number two, sin. The blood of Jesus cleansed the conscience, number one, Dead works, number two, sin, all right? So uh, now let's go to verse, uh, chapter 10, verse, um, uh, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, 
So do you see evil conscience? So the word evil is the word wicked. The Masu talked about it. It's the hardship. It's the state that man it falls into that hardship and the sweat of the face and working which God told Adam in Genesis. So write in your notebook number three is the evil. So the blood of Jesus cleansed the conscience from dead works, from sin, and from evil. So, so now go, let's go back to our story of uh, the flood of Noah. What happened was the apostle Peter says, listen, that flood saved eight souls. Now it is the antitype, the, there is an antitype to save us and that's the baptism. So now this baptism is the baptism that cleansed the conscience. But now when we came to read Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 and these verses, we realize that it's the blood of the sacrifice, is the blood of Christ that cleanses our conscience. So that means our conscience is that internal cup. Like Jesus said, clean the inside and not outside. So what needs to be cleansed inside every humanity, every human being, it's the consciousness of dead work, conscious, consciousness of sin and hard work and wickedness. But how do you do that? You need God, God needs to bring a flood into your conscience because he sees that the wickedness is really great in, the, in your conscience because now your thoughts and your conscience are so evil, basically. So from lower realm of the earthly and God says, you know what, my thoughts are are higher and I need to bring you up. How am I going to do that? I have to bring a flood that puts to death this every corruption that is in your conscience. And that's what the blood of Jesus is doing to cleansing your conscience from dead works, cleansing your conscience from corruption that sin brought, cleansing your conscience from that wickedness hard labor like Lamech said this son is going to make us free from our hard work and labor and that was pointing at the son Jesus who is going who is uh, going to find grace in the in the sight of God and God will save the rest of the earth he will, God will save his family through this salvation and Jesus came and says you know you are my brothers and then he says you are my children so the mankind humanity the race of humanity are in the family of Jesus and he just needed to save his family through the death of the cross so that the blood can come like a flood in your conscience and wash away everything so something amazing can happen and let me show you that let's go to Genesis chapter 6 and we want to take a look at the story of Noah and understand the understand God's master plan for mankind okay uh, so now let's go to if we continue going um, all right so uh, chapter 8 of uh, Genesis it says uh, let's let's read verse 1 then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him and the ark and God made a wind and pass and, and all this stuff is happening so now uh, uh, look at verse 4 it says then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th um, day of the month, on the Mount Ararat. So, as Masud said, if you missed it, I'm going to say it now again. Ararat means cursed, reversed. Let me repeat it again. Ararat means cursed, reversed. So, the land was in curse. It was corrupt. 
there was this you know every thought and imagination of the heart of man was corrupt on earth all flesh had corrupted themselves through that earthly mind, thoughts and imagination now god says you know what i'm gonna save eight souls and everyone in this boat and by the time the flood came and then they waited and waited and waited until the mount ararat was the mountain that came out of this um, uh, flood and the ark sat on a mountain that is called cursed reversed so what does it saying it says okay you know what the the flood once the baptism in christ let's let me put it this way the baptism in christ when the blood of jesus comes into you and washes your conscience that was cursed the conscience that was corrupt the conscience that was producing dead works the conscience that was in the slave of sin the conscience that was being ruled by evil the conscience that was like um, every imagination of it was evil and hard work when the blood comes it cleanses it's like a flood that cleanses your conscience from that um, you know evil and wickedness and death cleanses that so that resurrection of a land starts happening in you that is called cursed reversed so apostle peter says you know what this is the this flood is for salvation through the resurrection of jesus christ so when jesus went on earth and he shed his blood this flood came and now he's resurrected out of this flood so now that means the curse is now reversed so it's so basically what we see here is now noah is the symbolic of jesus it's it's regard it's what basically god did through noah it's he's doing through jesus so that you and i today can receive the fullness of the inheritance a land that is fully you know curse reverse and i want to say this please don't think i'm talking about the land in israel or land in some countries no the land that was corrupt eventually is your body the land the promised land that god gave to abraham was your body how do i say that acts chapter 13 Paul comes and says, guys, I have a good news for you. The promise that God gave to our fathers, Abraham, is now fulfilled at the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he's not going to go to corruption again. He's not going to taste death again. So he received a body that is incorruptible, immortal, and it's filled with the glory of God. So the promise that God gave to Abraham was a land that he must inherit. So now it says, guys, if that inheritance needs that, you know, that you start experiencing the fullness of the blessing of God in your life, it got to start with a conscience. It must start from the inside. So the blood starts working in your conscience conscience to cleanse it to 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 replace every imagination that you have so it can be the godly imagination so that eventually when the inside is closed the outside might the outside will be closed too the land that is cursed reverse will come out of that flood of your conscience out of the conscience that is cleansed by the flood so now maybe some of you are gonna ask okay how am I gonna do this how is it gonna the voice of the blood like how can I how can I cleanse my conscience you can't the blood can cleanse your conscience and your job is to learn what the voice of the blood says learn what God is doing learn what the blood is doing and this is what we are doing in these series here everything that we are learning is toward bringing us to an imagination of knowing who he is and what he has done so that the false images that we have it will wash away like a flood by the blood of jesus so you and i can see it truly so the first step is to see who he really is chew upon it think about it let's let's what you learn just sink down in your earrings let it like 
like well, every every truth of the gospel that you hear is the washing of your conscience and now today instead of thinking what am i gonna do how can i do this because we want this amazing life and we think we gotta do something and before you know you are the adam trying <laughs> to be like god and trying to be what god said you are and now it brings you to that work again and you start running and running and never arriving rather than realizing that no I'm this is who I am and what I just learned the truth I just learned I'm just gonna let it sink down and I'm gonna let it experience that joy of this truth that God is doing instead of now okay I heard it I heard it now I need to do something about it yeah you'll do you will do something about it as soon as you're settled down in your conscience and believe who you really are and that will be the fruit of this understanding that you have so isn't that amazing i want you to think about it isn't it amazing the work of the cross that he's doing you know let's go to isaiah chapter 55 so we read that one verse in isaiah chapter 55 and um, we read verse 8 and that um, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways so so God says you know what my ways are higher than your ways but now let's look at verse uh, we read verse 8 and 9 look at verse 10 for the rain comes down and a snow from heaven and do not return there but the water but water the earth and make it bring forth and what um, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me a void um, return to me void but it shall accomplish what it pleased so what happened in the flood of noah the waters of heaven opened and the, the fountain of the earth opened and it started flooding there was raining day and night until the earth was flooded so here says you know that rain that comes down from heaven it's the words in my mouth that's gonna come down and it brings that like a flood so we said oh, okay it's the blood of Jesus yeah but how does the blood works in you <laughs> Jesus said like he's the word became flesh is um, when Jesus in John chapter 6 is talking about whoever eats my body and drink my blood he shall have everlasting life two of when people left because they said this is crazy jesus turns to his disciples and he says you know flesh counts for nothing my words are a spirit and life so the word of god comes like a bread the word of god it's like a like a water the blood of jesus that is shed is now the word that reveals the blood to us so now here says so now when his word comes down like a water and brings that flood on earth is actually his blood that is cleansing you <laughs> but how does the blood works through the word and the spirit it has a voice the blood of jesus has a voice that speaks and that voice is the flood that comes down so here says you know it's gonna come down water the earth and now it says in, in we read that in the story of noah the waters started reducing on earth what happened they went up to heaven <laughs> and now the mount appeared because those words the waters have done their work so so that's why this is what happens the more you know the truth the more you experience the flood <laughs> it's do you do you have a, a little narrow river of the word of god flowing to you or you have the flood of god the word of god the truth that all constantly is like re, like pouring out on you or washing you so there's a huge difference you might have a little narrow line of the water or you can have the ocean of the water so here says the more you know the word of god so you the more you hear the word from his mouth the more you feel the flood <laughs> the flood that happens in your conscience so 
bless you everyone and uh, thank you so much for being with me and i want to encourage you to take a moment and think about the truth every teaching that you have just take a moment let it sink down in your ear add to it let his word come to you like a flood and i will see you or we will see you guys next week okay word of christ tremendous teaching thank you rose for bringing that incredible revelation of the work of the cross and of Jesus and his blood that we see in the story of Noah. And so Rose brought tremendous revelation through this teaching. Let's dive right into our recap point so we can look at some key components of this teaching that's really important for us to understand, meditate on, and take with us. The first is this. It says when, when you create a false image of God in your mind, that's called idolatry. And for many of us, we think of idolatry as those things that we read about in the Old Testament. It's a gold statue. It's a golden calf. It's something external. But really, it is anything that we elevate in substitute of the Father, in substitute of God. And when we elevate an image of God that is made of our own works or that is of our own understanding, then we're taking something that is not truly the character, the nature, the person of the Father, and we're elevating that in place of who God actually is. That is the work of idolatry. And so, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, well, I don't believe God can do that. I don't believe God can love me. I don't believe he can forgive me. I don't believe this about God, or I believe this about God. And we impose based on our own circumstances, based on our own experiences, based on our own failures in the flesh, we impose, we impose a definition of the Father in place of the love of God that actually is true. That is called idolatry. And the carnal mind that doesn't see through the Spirit sees destruction all the time. And the mind of Christ that sees, sees redemption. And what do we mean by that is people that are not looking through the Spirit, which is a spirit of love, which is a spirit of Father, can read the Scripture and can look at all the circumstances in their life, and all they see is re, uh, destruction. They see the bad. They see the evil. They interpret everything through the negative and through destruction. But when you look, and you look through your the eyes of the Spirit, which is our higher order of knowledge, our higher order of understanding, the very tree of life that we've talked about, then we see God's love, and we see His redemption, and it allows us to walk in that and in the freedom that it brings. So, uh, don't take your own definition of who the Father is. Create a false image of that and elevate that above who God actually is. The second point is this, is that the flood of Noah was not for destruction. The flood of Noah was for salvation of mankind. And we saw this connection uh, between the redemption of Christ and the flood of Noah. The flood is symbolic of the work of the cross, that it cleanses our mind, that we can ascend to God's higher understanding and higher order of thinking. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, calls the baptism of the resurrection of Jesus the current antitype. What does that word antitype mean? That word antitype means a like counterpart to the flood of Noah. So he compares the work of the Jesus Christ on the cross and the shedding of his blood uh, to the same type or like counterpart to what happened with Noah and the flood of Noah. And note what it says. It's so important. Why does this happen? What is the work that actually happens through this washing of the flood? It says, not that the removal of the filth of the flesh, that's not the purpose of it, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. And let me point out to you the direction of that good conscience. That good conscience, that right way of thinking, is not directed towards yourself, is not directed towards your circumstances. It's not, it's not a matter of mind over matter over the things and situations that you had. It all begins with how you think and process towards God. It says that it may bring a good conscience toward God. That is the work that Jesus came to do. That is the power of the Christ, uh, the cross. That is the power of his blood that is shed for us. It is like that flood that happened through Noah that cleanses, that washes away everything that is evil, everything that is impure, and brings the ability for us to understand the Father in the right way. 
And the third point is this, is that the blood of Jesus cleanses your consciousness from three things. And Rose was very delivered about these three things. So you're going to see them on your screen and we're going to highlight them to you here. The first is this, is that the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 9. Um, the second thing is that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 10 and also in Hebrews chapter 10. The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from evil. And remember the definition of evil that Masood had for us. Evil was your own labor. It was your own striving. It was your own works of what you strive to do. That's the thing that the blood of Jesus came to cleanse from our consciousness was, was those three things, dead works, sin, and our evil, which is us walking in our own works. And like the flood of Noah, the blood of Jesus cleanses, it purifies, it washes our conscience so that the curse that came upon the land that, that Adam introduced with his fall, that curse that falls upon the land, which ultimately is our body, gets redeemed and gets reversed. And we saw that through the teaching that Rose brought. The fourth point, this is one that we've made several times. It's been through the point, of, and I've snuck it in here um, in a few different ways, but I'm going to say it again in just another way here. The fourth point is this, is that there's nothing that you can do to cleanse your mind. There's nothing that you can do of yourself. If there was anything that you can do of yourself, we would immediately be in the law, which was works. So there's nothing that you can or have to do in order to, uh, for you to cleanse your conscience and to reverse the curse, that's impossible for you to do. It's the blood of Jesus through faith. It's through the acceptance of his work that brings that cleansing. So again, constantly moving our, our thinking from the position of works to the position of faith and accepting what the Father has done. And then the fifth and final point is this, is that the blood works through the word and the spirit. This is the activation mechanism. When we talk about how the blood comes and cleanses our consciousness, how does that actually happen? It happens through the word and it happens through the spirit. And we see this in Isaiah 55. Rose brought this out. As the rain came down, this is the father speaking, as the rain came down, so shall my words be that go forth from my mouth and it accomplishes what it sets out to do. So he equates his words as the rain coming down and and the blood of Jesus, we know it has a voice. We see that in Hebrews chapter 12, um, much like we read last week where Abel's blood cried out for the redemption of his brother. If you recall, we covered that. Um, so does the blood of Jesus. It has a voice and it speaks um, and it cries out for our redemption. And here's what I want to say about the flood and the blood of Jesus is, is that this can't be something that just trickles in. Think about the force of a flood. If you've ever had a chance to sit and watch the power of nature and watch the power of a flood, I know several years ago, many years ago, there was a tsunami that happened, and I, I saw the video of that tsunami and the overwhelming force in power when it came into land. You couldn't even really see it coming, but that flood came in, and it just cleansed the entire land. It wiped everything out, building, vehicles, people, everything. It just completely wiped it out. And in that same manner, the blood of Jesus is a force that comes in and it cleanses our mind. It gets into every nook, every cranny, and it just wipes out all the evil thoughts, all those thoughts that don't align to the truth of who the Father is. That's what the blood of Jesus comes to do like a flood, comes in and cleanses our mind. So there you have it, church, um, a powerful teaching this week on the flood of Noah and the redemption of the cross and the blood of, of Jesus Christ. So much goodness. Meditate on this. We only cover some, some brief recap points, but go back, watch the video, let it soak in. There's so much more in there um, that I want you to, to read and be blessed. And we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you, family.